the Shiki Science Show clips. Um, and so obviously the, the base editing has given us a massive toolkit then, but in terms of the actual editing, it's still obviously any um, a base editing, even with multiplexing, it's just editing a specific bases. And so obviously in terms of precision genome editing, there's still the kind of search for being able to make larger scale uh, genomic changes that we have control over instead of forming indels. And so um, I think that kind of nicely leads on to prime editing and what prime editing is and how what kind of challenges it was trying to solve. Right. Yeah. So um, to, to, to fill in that that story, I think it's a great segue. Um, you know, so the the Alexis Comor led uh, cytosine base editor can only make two kinds of DNA changes. It can change C's into T's and G's into A's. And so our first effort to really broaden the applicability of precise gene genome editing without double-stranded breaks was to develop a different kind of base editor, an adenine base editor, uh, which can change A's into G's and T's into C's. So it actually does the opposite of what a cytosine base editor does. Uh, that just by... Uh, because of the nature of human gene mutations, that adenine base editor turns out to be uh, the most useful kind of single base pair uh, corrector if your goal is to correct mutations that are responsible for pathogenic uh, changes in, in cells for diseases. So about half of uh, pathogenic disease point mutations are caused by uh, the kind of base pair change that is fixed with an adenine base editor. And so, so Nicole Godelli, a former postdoc in the lab now at Beam uh, Therapeutics, uh, developed this adenine base editor that changes AT base pairs to GC base pairs. And there, the project was, um, you know, I give her a lot of credit because uh, the, the key enzyme to deaminate adenine in DNA uh, wasn't known. There, there was no known, and there still is no known naturally occurring reported enzyme that will deaminate adenine into inosine in DNA. And so Nicole agreed to take the brave step of evolving her own enzyme as the starting material for this project, uh, even though in general in our lab we, we stay away from projects where step one is evolve a starting material because it sort of sounds like two significant projects, not one. Um, and so after a lot of hard work, she, she did uh, managed to evolve the first enzyme, uh, to our knowledge, that can deaminate adenine in DNA and convert it into a base that pairs like G. Uh, and then we could install that new deaminase that Nicole evolved into a base editing architecture, and then that led to the adenine base editor. And then we've further evolved it, which uh, led to these uh, superactive variants like ABE8E, uh, and that's the variant that uh, we and others are now seeing consistently uh, at, at some sites in certain kinds of cells, um, uh, you know, more than 90% editing. Uh, but, but even with the cytosine-based editors that Alexis developed and the adenine-based editors that Nicole developed, that's only four kinds of base-to-base -base changes. And of course, simple math will tell you because there's four different DNA letters and you can change each letter to three other kinds, that means there's 12 total ways you can mutate one base to another base. So the eight remaining mutations, which are called transversions, uh, we could not make with base editing, uh, at least not, not efficiently and directly. Um, and of course, uh, there are a large number of insertions and deletions, uh, the vast majority of which are small, fewer than 10 or 20 bases, that are associated with uh, really important genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis and Tay-Sachs disease, uh, so, uh, so it's been a, I think, a long-standing goal of the group since we started working with base editors to figure out a way to directly install those other kinds of base-to-base -base changes, and to install deletions or insertions um, again without making double-stranded breaks. And that led to the development of of prime editing, which can achieve those goals in uh, mammalian cells. Uh, so prime editing really began also with a prospective group member, um, a prospective postdoc named Andrew Anzalone, who applied to the lab. Um, he's a former MD-PhD student at Columbia. He worked with Virginia Cornish. Um, 
who was a former uh, lab mate of mine when I was a grad student in Peter Schultz's lab. Virginia was a postdoc in the lab. Uh, anyhow, uh, Virginia uh, recommended Andrew strongly, and and uh, when he came to the lab at the end of his meetings with various people, um, you know, I have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him right before he gives his group meeting talk, and I uh, asked him the usual questions. Um, you know, what other labs are you interested in? Uh, what kinds of projects do you envision working on? What's the time frame of your desired postdoc, et cetera? And when I asked him, what are you thinking of working on? He pulled out this um, kind of audacious idea uh, that, that he had written up into a slide, basically, <laughs> uh, which uh, proposed that perhaps we could use um, uh, a reverse transcriptase to directly copy this, an edited DNA sequence from the extent from an extension on a guide RNA into a nicked target DNA site. And, you know, it was a wild idea and there were all sorts of reasons why it might have failed. Um, it, it really took uh, a confluence of, you know, what at the time we called small miracles, but now I think just uh, to be to be more accurate but was just a reflection of the hard work of Andrew and coworkers to overcome. Uh, but I was excited enough by the idea that um, I asked him to do something I, I normally don't ask prospective postdocs to do, which was, why don't you present that idea at the end of your, your postdoc seminar? So he gave his group meeting seminar about his PhD work, and at the end, he put in uh, a slide on his idea. And, uh, you know, as you might imagine, the the lab uh, found it really interesting, but was also very skeptical about all sorts of various pieces of it, including the fact that when you nick DNA and you put on edited DNA, you have to figure out, the cell has to figure out what to do with that edited DNA flap, which is now redundant with the non-edited sequence that's still on the DNA double helix ahead of that nick. Uh, and uh, even if that edited DNA flap somehow, somehow ends up sitting down on DNA, you now have a heteroduplex where one strand is edited, one strand is non-edited, but the edited strand, the one you care about, was recently nicked. So isn't that going to be preferentially removed by mismatch repair, et cetera? Um, the answer to all those questions actually turns out to be yes, but uh, it still works. <laughs> um, so uh, to make a long story short, Andrew started in a test tube where we like to start out since we're, uh, our, our group has... Uh, has is historically made of chemists and we have strong chemistry ties. So we like to start out in a test tube where we can control and analyze things easier. Uh, his idea seems to be plausible in a test tube. In a test tube, he showed that uh, a Cas9 nickase plus a reverse transcriptase um, plus a guide RNA with uh, reverse transcriptase template added to its three prime or five prime end could template reverse transcription of the nicked target DNA site, and he ran all the proper controls to show that these weren't artifacts. Uh, and then he tried this in yeast cells, and it worked uh, quite well in yeast, um, which was starting to get interesting. However, yeast are addicted to all sorts of DNA repair processes that um, are very difficult to do in humans, uh, such as uh, homologous recombination, which is really easy to do in yeast. Uh, but very difficult to do in humans. In fact, yeast prefer to make homologous recombination products over indels in many in many cases in response to double-stranded breaks, whereas the opposite is true in, in human cells. So, um, so, so we were sort of cautiously starting to get excited, but uh, we really didn't know um, know if it would work in in mammalian cells. And so then he started trying in mammalian cells, and his first experiments were all complete failures, 0% editing, not even 0.5% editing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Andrew very quickly figured out what changes in the system were needed to get it to work in mammalian cells. And then I remember in one Monday subgroup meeting, uh, people walking to my office, every Monday we, everybody in the lab uh, presents in alternate Mondays, so everyone presents every other week. Uh, what what they've been up to, what problems they've encountered, what uh, results, positive or negative, uh, they've 
uh, garnered over the past couple of weeks. And uh, the lab helps brainstorm ideas for what to do next, how to fix problems, et cetera. Uh, and as we were walking in, uh, as the students were walking into my office that Monday, one of the students looked at me as he walked by and said, you are going to freak out, <laughs> <laughs> which is usually a good, a good thing to hear before one of these meetings. Uh, and, and, you know, I said, oh, why? And he said, because Andrew has data in mammalian cells. And so Andrew presented the first prime editing data in mammalian cells. And, you know, it, it was very modest. It was a few percent editing. But the fact that we could now install transversions and insertions and deletions for the first time at targeted sites in the million cells was, uh, was electrifying and, uh, and uh, just caused a sort of buzz in the group and an excitement and all sorts of brainstorming about what to do next. Uh, that was, you know, probably unlike anything I've seen in the 22 years I've been a professor. Sure, um, no, I, I bet it is. Um, and in particular, I think the most remarkable thing about the prime editing design is the fact that you extended the guide RNA. And so the guide RNA not only contains the primer site for the referred transcriptase, but it also contained the desired edit changes. And so what that meant is you didn't need to introduce a donor template that had the desired edit. And so in many ways, you kind of simplified the system as well. Right. And, and uh, you know, one of the several things that had to work out in order for it to be successful is, so as you point out, there's a primer binding site that has to complement the NICT DNA strand so that it aligns the NICT DNA strand here. Uh, so this part is the, use my YouTube, uh, use my, uh, my Zoom here. So this part is the primer binding site. Here's the NICT DNA strand. And then the rest of my right hand is the reverse transcriptase template. And so this structure has to align and reverse transcription then goes in this direction to copy the edited DNA sequence directly into the target DNA strand of the mammalian, of the human cell genome. Um, however, uh, this primer binding site here, therefore mathematically must complement the spacer part of the guide RNA. The guide RNA still has to do its main job of uh, programming the CRISPR protein uh, to engage the target DNA site. And so the primer binding site is complementary to the spacer, which means maybe all that a, a PEG RNA, a prime editing guide RNA, would end up doing is forming a sort of stem loop. <laughs> I see, um, yeah. So that was, you know, one of the, the, the risks. And, and indeed, we found that you have to be very careful how long that primer binding site is. You make it too long, even though normally polymerases love having lawn primer binding sites because it provides a bigger runway to more stable runway to initiate DNA polymerization. In this case, prime editing is all about walking uh, the line between a variety of boundary conditions and threading that needle so that uh, you can initiate these molecular events without uh, going, uh, without forming structures that and would ultimately be non-productive. So the primer binding site has to be of a moderate length, long enough to support reverse transcription, but not so long that it ends up impeding the spacer. Um, anyhow, so all of that ended up actually uh, working out. And um, after some uh, improvements and a lot of testing in uh, lots of different uh, uh, gene sites and in different cell types, uh, we reported prime editing at the end of, of 2019. And it's been subsequently, and then of course, shortly thereafter, everything shut down because of the pandemic. Um, but our lab and others have um, continued to use and advance prime editing. And now uh, there have been a number of improvements, uh, some of which have been uh, published by other labs, uh, others of which uh, we uh, hope to report this year uh, that following in the footsteps of base editing that have advanced prime editing towards uh, broader and broader applicability and uh, greater and greater efficiency. Uh, and you know, one thing that I think the roughly 30 or so prime editing papers or preprints that have already been published uh, seem to point to is uh, the DNA specificity of prime editing really does appear to be uh, very high, uh, higher than that of traditional CRISPR uh, gene editing uh, uh, platforms, because probably the, in order for the prime edit to actually take place, 
Watson Crick base pairing has to occur not just between the spacer and the protospacer, uh, the spacer of the guide RNA and the protospacer, the target side of the DNA, but also of the primer binding site and the nicked DNA strand. And then downstream between the three prime flap and the original DNA strand. So there's three different checks on DNA hybridization uh, on sequence fidelity that each serve as an opportunity to reject an off-target sequence. And we think that's uh, why prime editing is, has now been uh, observed in multiple labs to be uh, extremely DNA sequence specific. So that's definitely an added benefit then, right? <laughs> Um, and as well, um, at least in the original prime editing paper, to as you said with base editing, one of the problems is you end up with a mismatch, right, where one strand's got the, the edit and the other one doesn't. And so you want to kind of bias the cell to choose the strand of the desired edit. And the way that you did that was by having a secondary uh, Cas9 complex that induced a nick, like a bit downstream. And so have you find ways, um, obviously the concern with that is that you've now got a nick in two places, which could cause... Um, a staggered double-stranded break, which is something that you would maybe kind of want to avoid. And so have you found ways of circumventing that? Um, would that be an issue in terms of being able to translate prime editing to the clinic? Yeah, so if you nick that bottom strand, you do increase prime editing efficiencies, but you also increase indel levels. Uh, indel levels are generally, with that doubly nicked uh, uh, version of the prime editing system, are generally higher than that of base editing, but with still favorable ratios of editing to indels. So it might be, for example, you get 30% prime editing and you know 8% indels or something like that. Uh, um, so we have uh, improved that aspect of it in a, in a couple of ways, which we hope to report this year. Uh, one is we have identified um, some of the uh, the proteins that are implicated, that are involved in the prime editing intermediate advancing and resolution uh, and have manipulated those proteins to favor the desired outcome. Um, and uh, that uh, tends to increase prime editing efficiencies uh, in many cases to the point that you don't need the bottom strand nick anymore to get sort of therapeutically relevant levels of prime editing even in some therapeutically relevant cell types uh, like T cells or, or primary patient, uh, certain kinds of primary patient cells. Um, uh, also, we have uh, uh, developed variants of, I'd say, how to use the, we've become better at how to use the prime editing system uh, to uh, program that second NIC uh, so that it only occurs after the first uh, strand has been repaired. Uh, which minimizes the coincidence of having two NICs. And then finally, we've also uh, gotten better at choosing where to NIC, where to put that second NIC, uh, so that it minimizes the chance of uh, that the, the two NICs turn into a double-stranded break. NICs occur all over your genome uh, quite frequently. Yeah. Uh, it's estimated that, um, you know, at any moment, uh, there might be uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of NICs in your genome. Uh, so the, the trick to avoid turning NICs into double-stranded breaks if they're on opposite strands is to make sure that the NICs either never occur at the same time, or if they do occur at the same time, they're far enough away that there's plenty of watson crick based pairs to hold the, the double helix together um, and, and to avoid having the ends co come apart into a double-stranded break. So it's a, it's a great question, and uh, there are, I think, a number of approaches that uh, some published, some not yet reported uh, that improve that aspect of prime editing.